Hello comrades, it's the Finnish Bolshevik. This time we're gonna be talking about the American journalist and writer of contemporary history and political analysis, William Howard Hinton. His work focuses on China, both in the Mao era and also afterwards. He has written several books on China, I'm gonna go through all of them in chronological order and give my thoughts. But first, before we get to that, let's talk about Mr. Hinton himself. He worked in China during the Second World War and also afterwards, in the mid to late 40s. He was part of a United Nations project to bring tractors and those kinds of uh, modern farming tools to China. I think the idea was that they had a lot of um, land that had become uh, wasteland and they were supposed to try to reclaim it by the use of tractors. Well, apparently they ran into a ton of problems because uh, the local... uh, bureaucrats and warlords and whatnot apparently stole a bunch of the tractors but eventually Hinton makes his way to the uh, communist controlled areas this was in the late 40s the communists finally conquered all of China in 1949 but already before that Hinton was part of this uh, UN mission and he was working as a tractor technician I think the United Nations project came to an end in 1947 and pretty much All the Americans or uh, foreigners who were part of the project, they left China, but Hinton decided to stay because he wanted to see what was going on. He was interested in what was happening in China. So he got a teaching job at a um, school run by the Communist Party. He was teaching English. However, shortly after receiving the job, he decided to work as a tractor technician in carrying out land reform in the nearby area, in the village known as Longbow. He stayed in the village for six or seven years, participating in the land reform, helping the Chinese with farming technology. I think in 1950, or at any rate in the early 50s, they started getting tractors from the Soviet Union, so he was helping the Chinese figure out how those work, and in 1953, he returned to the United States. During his time in China, he had taken a ton of notes, he had written down a ton of his observations and a ton of uh, data about the land reform in the village of Longbow. However, all those notes and papers and documents, they were all confiscated by the United States government upon his return to the United States, and he had to fight for more than 10 years to get this material back. And his first book, Fan Shan, which details the process of land reform in the village of Longbow, was released only in 1966, even though he had all the material more than 13 years before that. He was also subject to constant FBI harassment. He was working as a truck driver, but because it was known that he was a communist sympathizer, he was blacklisted and he couldn't get a job as a truck driver anymore. And as a result, he decided to engage in farming because he had inherited some land from his mother. Now, the book eventually became quite influential in the late 60s, early 70s, because um, the Cultural Revolution started in China, and that uh, sparked a lot of interest in China. So, uh, the works of uh, other people, such as uh, Edgar Snow, Jack Belden, and those types of people, became more popular. Now, in the past, I've already made a video about the work of Edgar Snow, But, for example, Edgar Snow's Red Star Over China was published in 1937, and Jack Belden's China Shakes the World was published in 1949. Both of those were reprinted in the 60s and 70s and had a renewed popularity. After that, William Hinton went on a lecture tour and continued writing more books. But, let's get to the actual substance of this video, so let's take a look at his works. The first book, Fan Shan, a documentary of revolution in a Chinese village, published in 1966, is about land reform in the village of Longbow, mainly. Fan Shan means to turn the body over. It means liberation, politically, economically, ideologically. It basically means liberation in all kinds of different ways. In the book, the peasants oftentimes use the word Fan Shan to mean that... uh, 
the land reform in their case has been uh, carried out, that they've received land or that they've become liberated. But it can also be used to mean that nobody is oppressing them anymore, nobody's exploiting them anymore, oppressed nationalities might use it, women might use it, you know, so it's not only about receiving land. The book contains a ton of interesting stuff. For instance, it has a lot of detail, a lot of description and data about the material conditions that people were living in under the conditions of feudalism and under the rule of the landlords before land reform and before the communists uh, showed up. The various inhabitants of the village, they talk about how life used to be, what they did in the past and what they're doing now, that the landlords have been overthrown. As many people know, in pre-revolutionary China, landlords oppressed people, they might keep people virtually as slaves, women were considered property, the landlords might beat or kill people basically at will, their power was oftentimes completely limitless. Also something that's very interesting that is described in the book is the economic aspect of landlordism and feudalism. The feudal social relations of pre-revolutionary China completely prevented development of the productive forces and development of technology and the economy because the landlords had absolutely no incentive to invest in production. The semi-feudal colonial economy of China, the political economy of China was such that there was really no way that anyone could modernize it. And all these Western experts uh, came in... uh, with the idea of modernization, with investment of capital, with a uh, commodity market, with uh, uh, loans and credit and interest and so on. And they came into a country where throughout the hinterland there wasn't much of a commodity market, if any commodity market at all. And money wasn't capital in the Chinese hinterland. There was no one who who thought in terms of of money as, as an investment. There was no safe way that money could be invested in production. Money was used to buy land. Money was uh, turned into gold and buried in the ground. Uh, money was loaned out to indigent people who, who couldn't, who either were sick or didn't have enough grain to live till spring, and it was returned at 100% interest, 200% interest, 300% interest. None of these forms uh, in any way aided production. It is of no use to bid up the price of land. It didn't make it any more productive. All it implied was that uh, more people were bidding for it. Trying to start some kind of capitalistic business was both risky but also unprofitable because there was very little effective demand. There were very few consumers who had any money. And because the landlords couldn't really invest in production, what they did instead was they tried to get the maximum amount of rent from their tenants. Oftentimes this meant that the tenants would eventually become uh, completely bankrupt, they would have to sell their house, they would have to sell their family into slavery, they couldn't continue farming anymore. So it actually destroyed productive forces. And when the landlords got this uh, revenue, they couldn't invest it into anything, so what they did instead was they buried it in the ground. There was literally all this money buried in the ground, doing absolutely nothing. It was uh, silver money, I think, or possibly gold, but in any case, it was precious metal. Once the landlords were overthrown, people received land, and this was a huge economic advance because uh, all the farmers had an immediate incentive to improve their own production. Under landlordism, they didn't really have such an incentive because if they produced more, the landlord would only uh, increase the rent. After land reform, local uh, handicrafts and uh, local small industry also developed because during the winter season, the peasants couldn't farm, so instead uh, they tried to use that time for their advantage by producing some kind of handicraft products, or eventually, during socialist construction, they tried to use that time to uh, build infrastructure projects such as irrigation works and those kinds of things. Pretty quickly, the farmers also decided that uh, they need to pool their resources uh, The first stage of collectivization in China was actually um, mutual aid. So the government and the communists, they suggested that uh, people should make mutual aid groups so that, you know, if one family has one mule and another family maybe has a cart, they can uh, combine those, combine their tools. They can maybe use the mule and cart to uh, 
sell transportation services to other people and then raise a little bit of money, buy some seed, buy some fertilizer, buy some uh, tools, etc, etc. Then later they pulled their land, turned it into a cooperative, and actually the communists had an interesting strategy in trying to get the middle peasants also to join the cooperatives. It was that the so-called basic cooperatives, they gave their members revenue based on two different criteria, so how much they worked, and also how much capital they brought in. So that if two different people form a cooperative, if one person has land, the other person doesn't have land, then the person who doesn't have land, to compensate the other person, he will give a little bit of his revenue to the person who has land. Initially, it is a mutually beneficial arrangement, However, as time went on, the cooperatives became more wealthy, or at any rate, they started to accumulate more tools, more land, etc., and the productivity of labor increased, and as a result, the ratio of value that was generated by labor increased in comparison to the starting capital that... uh, some members of the cooperative uh, contributed, so that as the cooperatives moved to a more advanced stage of cooperation, they started to uh, diminish the revenue paid to owners of capital, so that initially the revenue might be split like 60-40, so that capital gets 60%, labor gets 40%, Eventually it would be evened, capital earns 50%, labor earns 50%, and eventually maybe capital only earns 10%, labor earns 90%, until eventually the cooperative would just pay a lump sum to the people who uh, contributed starting capital, and after that they would no longer earn any revenue on starting capital that they contributed at the beginning, and people could only earn money by actually working. What I find really interesting about this book is how it details the organizing activity of the communists. A good chunk of the book talks about this. The communists created so many different kinds of organizations to mobilize the maximum amount of people. They created so many different kinds of organizations, and many people belonged to several of them. They created the Women's Association, Peasant Association, which included all peasants, but no landlords. On top of that, they created the Poor Peasant League, The communists also created the People's Congress, which included all the members of the people. It only excluded uh, traders and, I think, reactionary landlords and uh, bureaucratic capitalists. There were some landlords, uh, the so-called enlightened gentry, who fought against the Kuomintang and who fought against uh, Japanese militarism and fascism. Those people were considered uh, enlightened gentry. They were exceptional landlords, obviously most landlords were completely reactionary. However, even members of the so-called enlightened gentry, they did still have their uh, excess lands confiscated, obviously, and they couldn't continue being landlords anymore. The communists and also non-party activists, they spent a ton of time on uh, organizing uh, discussions and debates, Generally, talking to people, trying to organize the people, trying to get the people to defend their own interests, trying to explain the communist uh, policies to the people. One of the main takeaways of this book is the democratic character of the land reform. So, even though there were all kinds of uh, mistakes and all kinds of uh, different things that happened, the land reform and the construction of the worker state, it was never just this um, commandist thing The communists never just simply showed up and gave people orders and said, okay, we order you all to do this. No, that's not how it happened. They painstakingly explained to the people the communist policies. Originally, the anti-Japanese United Front in the war and the United Front against the Kuomintang. Later on, the land reform and those kinds of things. And pre-revolutionary China was a very backward and uh, reactionary society, but the communists, they had to work with the people who were available, they had to work with the people who were there, and I think that's a very interesting aspect of the book. For example, in the old society, women were considered property. It was completely commonplace for men to be violent towards women. Everybody was also really superstitious, they all uh, worshipped various uh, local gods, their ancestors, they also believed in various other superstitions, such as geomancy, which means that the location of the grave of your ancestors determines your future, and all kinds of uh, miracle cures, and also everybody was illiterate. And also theft was very commonplace. Tons of labor was wasted because uh, 
when people were farming their own plot, they constantly had to keep guard so that nobody could steal their crops. Especially because there were so many landless people too. So the communists spent a huge amount of effort trying to re-educate people, trying to teach them that it's uh, completely pointless and even harmful to believe in superstitions. They tried to explain to the men that they shouldn't beat their wives. They uh, tried to explain to the older women that they also are not allowed to beat younger women, that mothers-in-law are not allowed to beat their daughters-in-law. Obviously, a major part in this was played by the Women's Association itself. You know, I can't even list all the different things that um, they had to tackle with, but for instance, in pre-revolutionary China, women were obviously not allowed to participate in any kind of uh, political activities, but women were also not allowed to participate in building construction because it was thought that women are unclean. So many different stories about people who engage in corruption, or they try to steal public property, or they want to be lazy. And these are all remnants of the old society, because in the old society, people didn't usually have any incentive to be hardworking. Another striking aspect of the book is the discussion of the various party rectification movements, or the so-called uh, passing the gate. Party rectification means that members of the party, the party cadre in the local uh, area, they have to face mass criticism by the people, and then the party members have to answer for it, and they have to make a self-criticism, and once the self-criticism is adequate, once the people accept the self-criticism, then the party member is readmitted into the party, and he quote-unquote passes the gate. If he fails to do this, well, then he is potentially expelled from the party. This is also a very interesting aspect of the book, because, you know, many of the communists themselves, they were almost as backward as the rest of the people, so some of them engaged in corruption, oftentimes because they didn't even understand that that wasn't something you should do. They engaged in abuse of power because they just were so used to that, they thought that that was what everybody did, and that it was completely normal, until they were criticized, and then uh, many of them finally understood why it was wrong, and they changed their ways. There was also the ultra-left, so-called poor peasant line, but uh, I will return to that at a later point in this video. Another thing that the book discusses in great detail is the classification of different families and different people. Everybody had to be classified, it had to be figured what class you belong in. Were you a poor peasant, middle peasant, rich peasant, landlord, or what? This was very important, because if you were a poor peasant, it meant you would receive land. If you were a rich peasant, you would lose land. If you had landlord property, it would be confiscated. If you had capitalist property, it would not be confiscated, because uh, at this point, China was going through a new democratic revolution, which was a bourgeois democratic revolution, which intended to attack feudalism, but it did not intend to attack capitalism. They went through several of these classifications because obviously sometimes people would be classified incorrectly. There were actually very complicated instances where um, a person who had been a landlord only five years ago, but he had gone bankrupt and he was now poor. Well, is he a landlord or is he a poor peasant? Well, eventually they decided that I think it was supposed to be uh, determined from three years ago. So if three years ago you were a poor peasant, that means you're still a poor peasant. The definitions of different classes became more and more specific as time went on, as they should, to avoid confusion. Obviously, the only way to create good and precise class definitions was uh, basically through trial and error. And I think the people in Longbow were classified three times, at least if they appealed it. If they thought that the classification was incorrect, they could appeal. The main political realization, I think, was that... Becoming liberated didn't mean that you receive land or that you receive adequate land. It was more about being freed from feudalism. Because, as we've seen in many other countries as well, for example in Hungary, we also uh, can see this, even in the land reform, people didn't necessarily receive adequate land. Because there was a shortage of land, there simply wasn't enough land for everybody. So some people got bogged down into this. They thought, well, the land reform must be incomplete because there still isn't enough land for everybody. But that's a misunderstanding because the land doesn't just come from nowhere. You can try to redistribute the land however many times you want, but 
if there simply is a shortage of it, there's nothing that can be done other than trying to develop farming and trying to um, create more fertile land. So even though land reform was about giving people land, it was mostly about destroying feudalism, because once you destroy the feudal production relations, that allowed production to improve and uh, allowed the creation of more farmland. Now let's finally move to the second book, although I will say this, Fanshan I think is definitely Hinton's best book, it's incredibly interesting, it's definitely worth reading several times, it only suffers from slight oversights, and that's because in hindsight Hinton was able to see some things that he didn't realize at the time, but besides that, it's definitely his best book. But now let's move on to his second book, Iron Oxen, a documentary of revolution in Chinese farming from 1970. This book is quite uh, autobiographical, it uh, discusses the more technical aspects and sort of farming and organizational aspects. It talks about his uh, time in the, the UN project trying to bring in the tractors and then his participation in uh, mechanizing the farming. And especially once they got the Soviet tractors, I think he was working for the state farm, if I remember correctly. And... This is a bit off topic, but it reminds me of something, because uh, a couple years ago I saw this guy sharing some videos from uh, some African country, and those videos showed some African workers trying to use some kind of uh, tools, some kind of even very simple uh, sort of modern tools, and they used them extremely badly, or they didn't even uh, know how to use them at all. And that person was sharing those videos and uh, trying to make some kind of racist remark, saying like, oh, look at these uh, subhumans, they don't even know how to use, like, they're so stupid, they must have an IQ of a hamburger, like, they don't know how to use any of these tools. They were really, like, commonplace tools that any one of us in the West would know how to use. But this book, Iron Oxen, it talks about how the Chinese, they tried to learn how to use tractors, and of course, they don't know how to use them. They immediately break them. They eventually figured it out and they started um, repairing them and whatnot. But I know that even in the Soviet Union, like when they brought the first tractors to some uh, Russian or Ukrainian village, the people had absolutely no clue what this is. They had never seen a machine like this before. They didn't know how to use it. And almost immediately the machine would break down because the people wouldn't know how to use it. And I think that just demonstrates how stupid those kinds of uh, racist arguments are. This book I also think is very good, but it's not as essential as some of his other works. Next up, we have Turning Point in China, an essay on the Cultural Revolution from 1972. This is a very short book, and I would say that it gives a pretty standard ML or MLM perspective on the Cultural Revolution. It's pretty much what we would uh, expect these days, I think, but it was definitely ahead of its time back then. It explains that the Cultural Revolution was about trying to overthrow right-wing revisionists who were trying to restore capitalism in China, who were called capitalist rotors. They were headed by Lu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping. The book criticizes them, but it also criticizes uh, covert rightists who were rightist in essence, but quote-unquote leftist in form, such as uh, Lin Biao and Chen Boda. I think it also talks about the aspect that the Cultural Revolution started in art because uh, there were artists who didn't want to make uh, specifically working class or socialist oriented art. Instead, they wanted to make sort of classical bourgeois art or uh, art that was universal humanist instead of class oriented. And some of those people, artists and other intellectuals, they were trying to criticize Mao and criticized Marxism covertly through culture. There was a military leader named Peng Tehuai, who was denounced and criticized by Mao and Mao's allies because he advocated a rightist policy during the Great Leap Forward or the uh, collectivization of agriculture and uh, the attempted uh, industrialization of China. You know, China declared itself a dictatorship of the proletariat. By and large, I think, abolished capitalism in 1956. What they wanted to do was to purchase the companies of private capitalists and thus abolish exploitation. Private capitalists 
oftentimes continue to work as directors in the companies that they previously owned. And I think they continue to earn 5% interest from the companies that they themselves had created. I think that was abolished in 1966 with the start of the Cultural Revolution, so that they no longer could earn any revenue from uh, those companies, and thus they were, you know, finally truly liquidated as a class. But in any case, Peng Dehuai was sort of seen as a representative of a rightist economic policy. Capitalist rotor artists wanted to use him as a way of criticizing socialism and criticizing Mao. A rightist playwright by the name of Wu Han created a play called Hai Rui, Dismissed from Office. It's about this minister from the Ming dynasty, Hai Rui, who is uh, sort of a good guy and he is... Um, opposed to unjust land confiscations and then as a result he is uh, dismissed by the emperor and that's supposed to be an allegorical attack on Mao that uh, supposedly because uh, Peng Dehuai was against the Great Leap Forward which was supposedly a bad policy then uh, Mao the supposed emperor expels him but maybe getting into those kinds of uh, small uh, details is a bit unnecessary But this one, it's a short book. I recommend it. It's definitely worth the read. Hinton also published another book in 1972 called The Hundred Day War, The Cultural Revolution at Tsinghua University. This book, in my opinion, was a little bit confusing and sort of chaotic, but maybe that's just because the situation that it uh, describes was chaotic. Mostly it talks about factionalism during the Cultural Revolution. Hinton was of the opinion that The Cultural Revolution really had a big problem of factionalism. But, in my opinion, the situation was basically this. When the Cultural Revolution started, ironically, Deng Xiaoping and Liu Shaoqi were originally sort of in control of the Cultural Revolution. The party tasked them with, you know, facilitating the Cultural Revolution. But the way that they facilitated it was that they went to various locations and they imposed party cultural revolution committees on the local people and then told them, okay, this is what you have to do. But what Mao wanted to do was he wanted the people themselves to organize and to criticize um, the revisionists in power and, you know, to criticize those in power more broadly and thus figure out who is a revisionist and who is not. Once the cultural revolution really got going, the main split was uh, between the genuine Red Guard rebels, and the sort of fake Red Guard rebels who were actually revisionist members of the party apparatus, or children of the revisionist members of the party apparatus. And the Cultural Revolution is often criticized for being violent and carrying all kinds of uh, stupid excesses. Typically, the right-wing revisionists, they created these fake Cultural Revolution organizations and then to sort of um, distract criticism away from themselves, they tried to find uh, old class enemies, so right-wing intellectuals, capitalists, uh, ex-landlords, and then persecuted them, often very violently, even torturing them, committing all kinds of atrocities, and also very violently attacking religion and tradition to distract attention away from themselves and to try to protect themselves or their parents if their parents were revisionist members of the party. Because the Cultural Revolution was supposed to vet the party, discover right-wing revisionists inside the party, discover capitalist voters inside the party. Because the revisionists opposed the Cultural Revolution completely and they tried to sabotage it by co-opting it and imposing dictatorship on the people, i.e. trying to co-opt the Cultural Revolution and trying to prevent the people from engaging in revolution. As a result, there emerged a ultra-left tendencies who wanted to overthrow all authority. They didn't want to spend the time and effort in figuring out, okay, which party member is a revisionist and which party members are not. Instead, they just wanted to overthrow all the party members and create completely new revolutionary organs. So the right-wing revisionist tendency, a sort of commandist anti-democratic tendency, gave birth to a uh, semi-anarchistic ultra-left tendency as well. The book also talks about the Lin Biao conspiracy, so-called May the 16th conspiratorial group, which presented itself as very leftist, but they were actually right-wing. And for a time they controlled the central committee's theoretical journal Red Flag, 
so it's actually really complicated uh, to figure out the situation because there were so many of these different uh, factions and they controlled various uh, aspects of the party's policy and also the party's media. This book, I'm not sure if I would recommend it to everybody, at least in my opinion, maybe it's just because I'm not knowledgeable enough on the situation, but I thought that it was a bit confusing. I think it's based on interviews that he did. So there's definitely a lot of information there and a lot of different people, they explain what happened, what their personal experience was, but in my opinion it perhaps lacked bigger perspective. Next up we have Shen Fan from 1984, where Hinton returns to Longbow Village 20 years later and he finds that it is now an industrialized town. And the book tells about all that has happened in the 20 years that have passed. Collectivization of agriculture, industrialization, cultural revolution, etc. Now, this book was obviously published in the Deng Xiaoping era. And it shows, because in this book, Hinton actually sort of conciliates and makes compromises towards uh, Lu Xiaoqi's revisionism. The book frequently questions class struggle in socialism. Because one of the main tenets of the Cultural Revolution was that class struggle continues in socialism and that there is a revisionist uh, capitalist rotor clique headed by Lu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping and that they need to be overthrown. Shen Fan um, reverts back and starts to question that uh, proposition. The book mostly condemns the Cultural Revolution as a failure. It describes Mao's actions as nepotistic, uh, factional, it defends Peng Tehuai, Lu Xiaoqi, although it does uh, admit that the right-wing revisionists are bureaucratic and that they go too far towards capitalism. This book was written during the time when Deng Xiaoping had already launched many policies towards restoration of capitalism, but, for instance, the communes, the collective farms, they were only broken up a year after the publication of this book, and Deng Xiaoping always claimed that he didn't intend to break up the collective farms. So Hinton obviously was fooled, he didn't realize uh, that the capitalist restoration was happening. And he himself admits this in his next book. He explains that when he wrote Shen Fan, he became confused and he thought that, okay, maybe... Mao was wrong after all, maybe the Cultural Revolution was wrong, maybe it was ultra-leftist, maybe the Great Leap Forward was ultra-leftist, but once Deng Xiaoping fully restored capitalism, Hinton realized, well, goddamn, we were all fooled. Mao was right all along when he said that Deng Xiaoping and Lu Xiaoqi are capitalist rotors who want to restore capitalism, and Deng and Liu were lying when they denied that. This book also very heavily criticizes ultra-left policies during the Great Leap Forward and blames them on Mao. In reality, ultra-left policies during the Great Leap were promoted and carried out by right-wing revisionists as a form of sabotage, but in Shen Fan, Hinton disagrees with the argument that uh, ultra-leftism was actually used by Liu and other revisionists. He also claims that the ousting of Peng Dehuai was a frame-up. Certainly, he got these views from uh, Chinese government sources, because at this time, he was absolutely swamped by reactionary right-wing, uh, anti-Mao, anti-socialist propaganda by the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party, which he later realized, but when he was writing this book, he didn't. This book is also very critical of the Gang of Four, all that being said, despite all those flaws of the book, it's a good book. It has so much information. It's his longest book. It has so much data. You just have to read it very critically. And that's sort of a problem with Hinton's work. The fact that he changes his position constantly. Even Fanshan suffers a little bit from this, because it has some mistakes that he corrects later. The books that he wrote in the 70s, they also have some issues that he corrected later and Shen Fan even more, much more problems that he corrected later. But, you know, that's also a very genuine thing that shows that he is a genuine, honest writer, because trying to figure these things out is difficult, even though a lot of these things were based on his own experience and being an eyewitness to a lot of these events. Understanding the politics behind it and the bigger perspective is very difficult. So only in hindsight 
he could get a more fuller understanding. Next book, The Great Reversal, The Privatization of China, 1978 to 1989, published in 1989. This book extensively documents the capitalist restoration in China by Deng Xiaoping, although it is uh, interesting because it's such an early work. There are many other books who talk about this topic that were written in the 2000s or even in the 2010s, but this book is from the late 80s. The capitalist restoration and privatization has obviously proceeded much further now than it uh, had in the late 80s. So in that sense, this is an interesting time capsule of a book. It still is very critical of the Gang of Four. Hinton was always very critical of the Gang of Four. I've seen various authors of various different positions make various uh, evaluations of the Gang of Four. I don't really know what to think of them. Some people say that they were revisionists left deviationists, some people say they were only making uh, leftist mistakes, but they were still by and large good people, they were just making some mistakes, I'm not sure, I don't, I don't know. But Hinton certainly is very critical of them. This book also discusses the Tiananmen protests and the massacre that took place. Hinton was very favorable towards the protesters. He said that the protesters, even though they were very heterogeneous in terms of uh, their politics, that many of them supported bourgeois democracy, while some were Maoists. He still says that the demonstrators are not the reactionaries and not the rightists in China, but instead uh, Deng Xiaoping and his clique are the rightists and reactionaries. He was actually there at the time. He witnessed some of the demonstrations, and he also interviewed people, uh, his friends, who witnessed uh, some of the killings. He wrote an article called Why Not the Capitalist Road? The Tiananmen Massacre in Historical Perspective, in a book called The Future of Socialism, Perspectives from the Left. And uh, in that book, he says, for instance, quote, whenever two or 250,000 people gathered there, the soldiers fired point blank and mowed them down. I only witnessed the last time this happened, but my friends who had been there all day and kept notes said it happened at least six times. The only warning the victims had was that when the soldiers were about to fire, they ran forward a few steps, then aimed and fired, unquote. In any case, it's interesting to see the ruthlessness of the Deng Xiaoping government. The government of Mao never needed to massacre thousands of unarmed people just like that. Then uh, let's talk about the next book. This one from the 90s called Ninth Heaven to Ninth Hell, The History of a Noble Chinese Experiment. This actually was written by a Chinese uh, author by the name of Qin Huai Lu, but Hinton edited the book and also added uh, editorial comments. And this book is about a person named Cheng Yonggui, who was a very poor farmer, who eventually became the head of a commune called Dasai. And Dosai eventually became uh, a so-called model commune. It was a very advanced commune that achieved very great successes in developing uh, farming, uh, creating big infrastructure projects, irrigation works. They were also politically very advanced. Uh, the people in Dosai were very motivated to build socialism. It eventually became a very famous commune throughout the country and also throughout the world. There was a communist slogan at the time called Learn from Dosai. So this book is mostly just a history of Chen Yonggui and Dosai about how at first it was a poor place, then it became uh, successful, became advanced, and later it was attacked by the Deng Xiaoping government because they had to discredit any kind of uh, collective farming. So they had to also attack Dosai and claim that all their achievements were a bunch of uh, frauds. This book is also very critical of the Gang of Four, and it's very favorable towards Huo Guofeng. Hinton makes very useful editorial comments. He writes that uh, Qin Huai Lu doesn't really fully understand the class struggle that was going on, or perhaps it wasn't possible for them to write about it. Also a very worthwhile book. The final book, Through a Glass Darkly, American Views of the Chinese Revolution, published in 2006. It is mainly a response to anti-communist propaganda. It discusses American anti-communist narratives on China. It discusses how academics that Hinton knew viewed China, how capitalists viewed China. But it focuses on responding to a book called um, Chinese Village Socialist State, which is 
you know, your typical BS uh, capitalist attack against socialism. In this case, it is specifically an attack against Mao and Mao era policies. It's very similar to what happened during de-Stalinization, because when the Khrushchev government in the Soviet Union launched the de-Stalinization uh, campaign, they released all this anti-Stalin material, and instantly, anti-communists in the West took all that material and used it to create all these anti-communist books that were targeting the Stalin-era Soviet Union. So it actually gave so much ammunition to anti-communism generally. This is very similar. The government of Deng Xiaoping launched a massive anti-Mao campaign, and then instantly Western anti-communist authors took all that material and began creating anti-Mao and generally just anti-communist books, attacking Mao in order to attack socialism altogether. And Hinton tries to respond to those uh, attacks. There's a chapter on the famine that took place in the late 50s, early 60s. And Hinton shows very convincingly how false statistics or uh, distorted and falsified statistics are used to support a dishonest narrative about this uh, famine. We all know the basic anti-communist spiel. They claim that uh, Mao wanted to collectivize agriculture. He did that, and as a result, there was a massive famine, biggest famine in the world history, yada, 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 billion people died. The reality is that we don't really know how many people died because there weren't good statistics at the time. Also, there were mass migrations because people were moving around trying to escape the famine. As a result, uh, it was very unclear how many people were in what location. Even if they did calculate the population, many people were calculated several times because they were moving around. But Hinton shows that there was actually much more food available than the statistics typically show, because the statistics uh, exclude grain from the food supply because it was supposedly used as animal feed, but he says that, and he knows this because he was actually there with Chinese farmers, he knew what the farming practices were in China, he says that Chinese animals at the time were almost never fed grain, so all that grain, millions of tons, should be added to the available food statistics. He says that uh, statistics reduce the amount of potatoes and certain other crops by as much as 60% because potatoes were considered less valuable and thus valued only at one-fifth of grain in terms of their value. However, as actual food, they are not only one-fifth, but maybe three-fifths of grain's nutritional value. He says that statistics uh, calculate huge losses of grain in milling and processing, but in reality, especially in hunger conditions, the peasants obviously didn't actually turn grain into highly refined flour, but instead they just ate coarse whole grains to get more food. They didn't want to waste grain by milling it, or at least not milling it very thoroughly. He says that, according to statistics, People needed a lot of food because they were so active, but in reality, elders certainly weren't so active and didn't need so much food, and many people were also idle during the winter, and thus didn't need as much food. And through all these corrections, we actually see that there were tens of millions of tons more food in China than the anti-communist statistics would imply. So the famine couldn't be nearly as bad as uh, anti-communists claimed. Now, of course, this is only one aspect of the anti-communist uh, falsification, but it is still a noteworthy aspect. He says that um, anti-communists claim that uh, the famine prematurely killed all these people, but premature deaths due to famine are hard to calculate since they usually affected elder people. And, you know, if a really old person dies, who can say whether it was premature? Well, sometimes you can probably say, but sometimes maybe not. This book also, it gives the most politically developed version of Hinton's views. His analysis of uh, Chinese politics reaches its peak in this book. It's the most updated version. He makes some corrections of uh, his previous views. He says that when he wrote uh, Fan Shan... He considered the ultra-left poor peasant line to be simply a mistake. He said that um, the peasants mistakenly engaged in ultra-leftism. He now realized that it was actually conscious sabotage by revisionists. The poor peasant line was an ultra-leftist tendency which attacked middle peasants, calling them rich peasants, and 
It focused on um, attacking ex-landlords and trying to get the ex-landlords to tell where they have hidden buried gold, because some of them actually had uh, buried a bunch of gold. But the thing is, most of this gold was discovered very early on, but because there was still a scarcity of land even after the land reform, revisionists were able to create this ultra-leftist uh, poor peasant policy, which uh, tried to get the poor peasants to attack the ex-landlords and get them to reveal the location of even more buried wealth, even though a lot of times this wealth simply didn't exist or it was very little. So it just wasn't worth the trouble. They committed ultra-left excesses and it didn't really achieve a whole lot. And it also confiscated properties from middle peasants, which later had to be returned because it was unjustifiably confiscated. Hinton realized that that was actually conscious sabotage by the um, revisionists, and not simply a mistake by the peasants. In general, he finally makes the very significant realization that the right-wing revisionists always engaged in basically the same strategy. First... When some kind of progressive leftist policy was suggested, the right-wing revisionists opposed it. For instance, Liu Shaoqi even opposed land reform. During the anti-Japanese war, the communists had wanted to unite all the people, all the anti-Japanese, all the anti-fascists, all the patriots, including even patriotic bourgeoisie and even anti-Japanese landlords. And to facilitate this, they said that they're not going to confiscate landlord land, instead they only force landlords to reduce rents, alright? Once they won the war, they said, okay, that's over, now we move on to land reform, so now, landlords, now your stuff gets confiscated. Well, Lu Xiaoqi opposed it, he said, no, we shouldn't do that, we shouldn't carry out land reform. Instead, the right-wing faction of Lu Xiaoqi, they said that they should protect small and middle landlords and also rich peasants, and only attack rich landlords. Well, that wasn't accepted by the rest of the party, and the land reform was launched. But then, the revisionists, they switched strategies. They thought, okay, well, since we couldn't prevent land reform, we're gonna sabotage it, to make it seem like a bad idea. Then they started this poor peasant line, where they tried to destroy the worker-peasant alliance. They basically tried to implement a Trotskyist policy, Trotsky had seen all peasants as reactionary, Trotsky had seen the middle peasants as the same as the kulaks, the Chinese revisionists, they tried to do the same thing, they tried to get the poor peasants to attack the middle peasants, and thus making the middle peasants the ally of the rich peasants. While the communist policy, both in the Soviet Union and in China, had always been rely on the poor peasant, win over the middle peasant, isolate the rich peasant. During the Great Leap Forward, the Liu Chaoqi and Deng Xiaoping revisionists used exactly similar tactics. First, they opposed the Great Leap Forward, they opposed collectivization. Once collectivization was launched, they tried to advocate ultra-leftist policies to make the collectivization fail. Practically all the uh, erroneous ultra-left policies were wholeheartedly supported or even launched by Liu Chaoqi and Deng Xiaoping and their supporters. And this was very interesting to me because This is so similar to what happened in the Soviet Union, how the right opposition and the left opposition, they united and they opposed socialist policies, but they then tried to use ultra-leftism to sabotage it. Stalin combated ultra-leftist policies, for instance, in his uh, famous work Dizzy with Success. Yeshov, for instance, was a member of the right opposition who used extreme ultra-leftist policies as a form of sabotage. And many people don't think that that's possible. Many people think that that can't possibly be the case. But if you read, not only from Hinton, but also from other writers like Mobo Gao, for instance, if you read his book, uh, Constructing China, and you see what kinds of things Liu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping did, it becomes very believable. Deng Xiaoping and Liu Xiaoqi, they committed all kinds of atrocities under the guise of ultra-leftism purely as a form of sabotage when they themselves were actually very committed rightists, and not ultra-leftists. They kept doing this during the Cultural Revolution. They tried to co-opt the Cultural Revolution, and they launched all kinds of uh, crazy ultra-radical policies as a form of sabotage to try to discredit the whole movement. Alright, so I think that's pretty much it. If I had to say... Which books I would recommend the most? I think Fan Shan, definitely uh, Hinton's best book. 
On top of that, if you want to only read, say, three books, then Funshan, The Great Reversal, and Through a Glass Darkly, although I also heavily recommend Turning Point in China, I think Funshan and Through a Glass Darkly are Hinton's best work. All the other books are worthwhile as well. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Take care.